hey, thank you uh, for taking the time to uh, speak to us about uh, your new documentary, Mommy or Daddy. My pleasure. Especially from Japan over there. Yes, it is uh, 9 a.m. in Tokyo. <laughs> well, ab absolutely. Well, it's it's just barely 4 p.m. over here in the West Coast of the United States. So it's a it's a wonderful documentary. So let's let's ask this basic question. What sparked you to make this documentary, Mommy or Dad? Well, I grew up in Japan. I spent my whole life here. Um, I studied film and TV in uh, LA and Hollywood, lived in Hollywood for a while, um, then moved back um, and been making documentaries uh, for Japan's uh, public broadcaster, NHK, which is the BBC of Japan. And my really, really good friend, um, he's like a brother to me. One day he came home to his house. He was married with kids and uh, his partner and his kids and much of his belongings had just vanished. And he, at first he was, he just didn't really know what, what happened. So um, he tried calling his wife and, you know, his and then friends and tried, tried to figure out well, what happened. Um, and it happens that this is actually really uh, common in Japan where a uh, spouse, when they detect uh, a divorce is brewing, they will um, take their children and much of their belongings and just vanish, just leave, disappear from um, existence. And the reason uh, they do this is um, a part of the, a weird law in, in, Jap in Japanese law that um, it's Japan only has um, sole custody, not joint custody. And so that puts parents against each other. So when uh, my friend, I'll call him Jerry, when Jerry, I can't really say his name for legal reasons, but um, when he found out that, you know, his life would be changed forever, forever and uh, he probably would never see his kids again, um, I kind of walked him through um, that really dark, uh, period in his in his life um that was the first time i actually heard, uh, knew about it. i grew up in japan but never knew that this thing was happening that 150,000 children every year um are taken from one of their parents um and i had no idea when i started doing some uh because i'm a journalist in japan as well as a documentary filmmaker i started doing some uh investigation into this issue uh, and found out actually th there were a lot of people who were close to me um, um, even, who experienced this, especially um, at a younger age. So the, the main character in my film, Rie, she went to high school with me and she had also not seen her son in 12 years. And so when I heard her story, I was like, OK, I, I really need to document um, this this um uh, issue and also her her journey of um going on a journey from completely dis devastation to um trying to rebuild her life and this is actually quite a common um occurrence that this happens in japan not just to foreigners but to japanese people as well so that was kind of like the uh motivation behind it was my, my friend uh, jerry and uh the main character of the film it just just a lot of people around me i didn't realize that this was such a common thing that you know your life the, your spouse and your uh, children just disappear hmm. so how did you manage to convince her to participate into uh you know such a tearful subject like this especially what went on with her life so at first, um, she was uh, experiencing uh, panic attacks when we first approached her uh, to about filming this. And she, at first, she was uh, um, very cautious, uh, wary even to be a part of it. Um, partly because she thought that, uh, I mean, even though it had been 12 years since she had seen her son, she was still dealing with uh, PTSD type symptoms. And so, we were very cautious about, um, you know, w whether we should even um, have her participate. But, um, and even on the first day of filming, uh, she had to um, take breaks and just, we, we, we had to, 
split the um, interview process into like uh, three different chunks because she would um, get into these panic attacks. But the, 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 the reason that she actually participated in it, even though she was um, quite nervous and uh, cautious about it, was she felt that she needed to tell her story so that other people in her situation knew that they weren't alone. And she wanted to um, be, uh, you know, so someone's um, ray of hope, you know, that, that they can, because a lot of people are dealing with this um, from a young age, you know, being separated from their parents. And she was separated from her mother. And then she was separated from her son. So it's both, right? It was It's a generational thing for her. And so she wanted to be, um, a light, you know, a, a ray of hope for people who are dealing with this right now. And that was ultimately why she just uh, decided to be a part of the filming process. But it was a very slow, cautious filming process where we had to, like, be very careful of her emotions as we were, and her PTSD symptoms as we were uh, filming. So if you don't mind me asking, how long was this uh, film production um, with her? Because it, I, 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 I noticed changes. Yeah, if you notice, her hairstyle changes uh, quite a bit in the film. As because we shot, uh, we be we began shooting in two thousand seventeen, um, early two thousand seventeen, and didn't actually wrap a shooting until uh, Corona. So, um, so it was a long process of uh, filming, and, and part of the reason was, um, you know, her. Uh, we just wanted to make sure she was comfortable with the pace and, you know, and, and as also we're documenting her life, right? So things don't um, improve in people's lives automatically. It, you know, we, we, we documented her journey over, you know, about a three year period. Um, and you can really see her transition right in front of the camera because it's, it was in real time. We were shooting in real time. And uh, so this was actually like, as she was going through the process of, healing and deciding whether, you know, to go see her son, find her son, we were seeing her transform in front of the camera. So how did you know what direction that she was going to take this story? Or you just basically decided just to just to go with it? Because, you know, there there are like certain things like, you know, her mother, her son, or even uh, meeting others who experience the same, same thing. So um, I had never done anything like this before. I make uh, news feature documentaries for um, the public broadcaster NHK, but this was a very different kind of uh, story, obviously. And, and, and the way to film it was, was complicated because um, obviously we had to be there with the cameras when the action happened, right? But, you know, life happens when the cameras aren't rolling. Um, and so... We would just set dates and, and and just film, and sometimes we would just you know hang out with her. Um, we hung out with her at her at her house, and um, you know we would just film. You know, so we had a lot a lot of footage, and um, I didn't really know what she was going to decide to do, um, and so I I was very as we were filming, I was constantly checking to see if if um if she was okay and, and this is what she wanted she really wanted and she wasn't pressured into doing anything um at the end of the film i won't make any spoilers but uh, the bridge scene where um you know she's standing on one side of the bridge and her son's house is on the other side like i really didn't know like ultimately you know what was going to happen and so what what we did was we just filmed her life for three years and then on the editing we really brought it together to make it um you know uh, to to make it a understandable story um a narrative and, and a flow so um it actually took me I, I it was the seventh edit it was when finally i could start to see uh, the narrative coming into place because we had just so much footage and just and it was just you know where where is the story um so it was it was a really new kind of um a way of filming for me it was almost like reality tv you know and we we have streaming and netflix and you see like you know um queer eye for example you have camera multiple cameras and 
Um, and, and you don't, you can't say, hey, could you redo that? You just can't do that. So another another thing that we did, much, much like probably Queer Eye does, is we had multiple cameras rolling at, at once so that if we got something really good or, you know, if the applicable to the story, we'd have multiple uh, angles to shoot, that, right, to, to be able to um, edit it together later. So at so at sometimes we had three cameras rolling at once, so. So in reality, you didn't know that was going to be your ending when when you filmed that um, scene. We we really um, yeah we, we we got into actually a few um, discussions like like what what is what you know what where is this going to end up and um, so we we put, kind of put it that put everything in in. Uh, the main character's hands to, to do what she was comfortable with and and she kind of drove the narrative mm -hmm. now tell us about this organization she eventually got involved with uh, npo weeds am i pronouncing that correctly yeah yeah so npo weeds is um the organization they're an advocacy group for children of divorce in japan and the um the head of the organization uh, Ayumi Mitsumoto, she actually started the organization, that nonprofit, because uh, she experienced um, separation from her mother. So her, her father, in the middle of the night, um, had her and her little sister get in the car with him and then just drove off uh, when she, when she, when Ayumi was 14. And Ayumi knew that she wouldn't see her mother again, but her little sister, um, didn't know and in the when the, in the film uh, the animation portion um her little sister asked her dad what about mom and the the, the her, her, her Ayumi's father says you know her mom's coming later or something like that and uh, Ayumi knew that that was a lie that she would never see her mother again um perhaps or not for a while until she was an adult but her little sister didn't know so um, anyway, that that was the that was how she grew up, and she didn't see her uh, mother for many many years after that. Um, but she decided that she wanted to prevent that kind of trauma that happened to her from happening to other children. So she set up this organization called uh, Weeds Nonprofit, um, and she now what she does is she tries to um, get parents who are you know in the middle of a messy divorce and custody battles to kind of take a step back, take a breather and be like, I know that you're, you're very angry at your spouse, that you are completely just, just wanting to kill them probably right, you know, right now. But can, can I remind you that this is what you decide to do in this moment will echo in your child's, you know, uh, life for, for their entire life. Like this, this is a moment that you have a chance to either scar your child for life, or if you deal with it well, they will forever be, you know, grateful, thankful. And you know, they won't have to spend a lot, a lot of money on uh, therapy. <laughs> so she does that. So she actually talks. So they're in the scene, one of the scenes that she's talking to a mother who, you know, it's just, it's just too hard. She's tried visitation and you know, it's just, they just not, they're not getting along. And she's like, you know what? I, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to let the father of my son see my son anymore. And she just convinces her, you know, on the phone, like, I know this is hard, but, you know, and, and a lot of times what she, how she convinces these parents is that she tells her own story. You know, she says like, this is what happened to me. And this is how I see my, what my father did, you know, like, so she, so what she does is she, uh, orchestrates visitation in japan visitation is very different from the u.s um you only get a few hours a month that's the best case scenario um in the scene that we showed the visitation that father only sees his kids one hour every three months so only a few times a year and this is absolutely normal in japan like the courts give you a few hours a month and they're like oh aren't you aren't you so happy that you got a few hours a month and 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 the rest of the world is like what in what where, what world are you living in but this is totally normal in japan this was what's happened you know ever since um the end of world war ii 
Um, and so this is just um, a really sad situation for the kids, you know, let alone the, 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 the non-custodial parent. So anyway, Ayumi's organization is trying to help um, kids be able to maintain their relationship with both parents. I, I feel like this is a, a really uphill battle because it's you, you talk about an unchanging culture that, you know, that strives on tradition for hundreds and thousands of years. Yeah. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's the, 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 it, it's, it's a historical reason for, for, and the, and we talk about this in the film as well, but, um, there was always this sense where children were the property of the household. And so, the um up until the major restoration in the 1800s the father was head of the household therefore the children were the property of the father then after world war ii um things began to shift and the u.s um created a new well the u.s after the u.s occupation of japan um there was a there was a move toward okay women's contribution to the role of um well women rearing children is really important for their mental state and so there was a shift but it wasn't a, a positive shift because now the children were the possession of the mother so they there's still this I concept that children are the possession of the parent and therefore it's either they're either the possession of the father or the mother right and usually it's the mother nowadays uh but it's it's just this um it just is, um, yeah, this age long, this very long uh, tradition and history that this is, this has just been the case, you know? And so it's completely new to um, the political system, court, the judicial system in Japan to think about, okay, wait a minute, do children have rights to continue their relationship with their, with their, with their parents? You know, this is a completely new idea. And, but this is actually um, beginning to change because actually right now, right, um, this is really timely because the, the Japanese government, um, for the first time in history, is um, created a, a government poll to uh, survey the all of Japan. And it's open from December 6th to uh, mid February, and they're getting opinions from the rest of all of Japan about whether to implement joint custody for the first time in history. And wow. so this movie is really important in the sense of getting the word out that, hey, you know, what, whether, what do you, whatever they decide on joint custody, but let's, you know, this is like separating your kids from a parent, you know, um, it has long-term damage to the child's well-being, mental state, um, like I said, like um, the one of the uh, professors that I interviewed, um, Dr. Amy Baker, uh, she her in her research she found that you know parental alienation or you know separating a child from a parent or talking negatively even even talking negatively about a parent is is a form of emotional abuse and sometimes that emotional abuse is worse than physical abuse or even sexual abuse at times. You know, I mean, when I heard that from her, I was baffled because you don't think about, I mean, uh, you know, sexual abuse of a child is just, you know, that just, that's just something we, you know, whoa. But then when you, when, when she said that in her research, she found that this kind of separation from a child, from a parent or talking negatively, uh, negatively about your spouse, uh, ex-spouse is sometimes worse than sexual abuse to a child. I'm, I, that, I mean, that's just, that's just revolutionary. To, you know and, and that and that needs to that that knowledge needs to be um known you know well certainly uh we hope that you know the, the government of japan moves in the right direction now one of the major things that i also want to point out is that uh, as you mentioned before is the animation sequences is um you actually input that um in your film um throughout uh tell us about the decision of uh you know, going with certain animation sequences for certain scenes and how you, you um, pull it off? So, um, obviously, in, in, in documentary filmmaking, you can't really always get um, a scene from the past, obviously, right? So, um, I would, when, when deciding on what how to um, show what happened to each of the characters in their past, so usually all of these 
uh, animation se sequences are things that happened in their past that obviously we couldn't film. Um, you know, some people use uh, photographs, for example, or, um, but I, I love animation. I love anime. Uh, I grew up in Japan. Anime is a, is a huge part of Japanese culture. Um, it is, you know, one of uh, the main uh, ways that Japanese tell stories is anime, right? Um, and so that was also also a reason is I wanted to bring out that element of Japanese culture of anime. And the animator, um, his style is not very anime-like, but his influences are very Japanese. And so I really liked his style. His style of animation was very um, soft and warm and, and felt like I was... You know, it, it was it was just a very. I felt I felt it worked perfectly for what what I what I wanted to convey and about really painful past. Um, because all of all of the animation sequences are talking about a very painful past, which is very jarring and glaring. And um, but he did it in a way that was 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 gentle. You know, it was very gentle, soft. The the color palette he used. Um was very warm you know and so it was a it was a nice contrast of a very jarring deeply devastating memory but the warmness of it so it's kind of like even 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 the memories of these painful pasts are even though they're painful by the animation it was almost part of the healing process right this is this is what happened it's almost like um you know, right now with PTSD, there's a lot of research with um, MDMA, using MDMA to process PTSD, right? So it's it, 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 these therapists still use MDMA, um, the active ingredient in ecstasy, obviously, um, in, in a controlled environment. And what, for example, soldiers in battle, they will be able to revisit their really, really painful memories of war under the influence of MDMA and be able to talk about it and and convey their experiences and kind of be able to heal and that and, and in a way the animation was kind of like that for me it was it was a way to revisit their dark memories but do it in a way that was um not as painful and, and you know so it was it was kind of that was my motivation behind making the animation and using that animator absolutely i think you captured that uh what well said perfectly um so uh let, let me wrap this up uh with uh with your documentary mommy or daddy is that as a uh, as audiences you know around the world uh, like say to say will have a chance to watch uh, mommy or daddy what is the one most important lesson that you hope that they walk away with after viewing your film probably the biggest thing i want to convey is um as adults, um, what what we decide to do uh, to our kids in front of our kids, um, you know, with regard to even if you're not divorced, you know, um, the 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 words that we say uh, in front of our kids or the words we say toward our spouse or our partner, that being what you know, even even in even in a you know a happy marriage or it doesn't even have to be a marriage, like wherever wherever children are involved, right? The things that we say in front of them and to them, um, I just w want us as adults to just just take a step back and think about um, what that may do to you know the future of our of our children and the children, all children, you know, whether that be even if even if people don't have um, children of their own, like. There's, there's all, they're all children, you know, your, your nieces, your nephews, your grandkids, like just speaking negatively about, you know, say their parent, you know, could have drastic implications that we don't, we might not think about. Um, that's, that's the main thing, but also um, to even pull back a little bit more, um, this, this, this movie explores uh, isolation and separation and, uh, like we've all had really a difficult few, you know, several years with Corona and being locked inside, isolated from the rest of the world. And 
mental health is 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 a huge issue right now. It was before the pandemic, but it's even more now. And this movie explores um, the isolation and and the pain of being separated um, from from people from community. For the main character, she was separated from her mom and her dad and uh her friends kept separating from her and she was alone for a lot of her life and we we explore her journey of realizing the things that led to her isolation and her separation and her journey toward uh connection and so this movie is also about going from isolation to connection and and i think everyone who's experienced the pandemic the past several years can relate to that well said, well said. And I and I certainly hope that your film do actually spark the change that's actually needed as people, be, more people become aware of it. And it's, like you said, it's very timely. Well, John, hey, thank you very much uh, for attending this conversation about your documentary, uh, Mommy or Daddy. I can't, uh, can't wait to see what else you uh, um, come up with uh, across the other big pond of the world <laughs> for us so it's, it's a pleasure. yeah we're we're we're, uh, we're working on our another documentary at the moment so yeah so mommy or daddy um it's exclusively um on tubi in north america We've, we're doing a, a worldwide uh, release but in north america currently it's exclusively on tubi so uh, if anybody wants to watch it that's the best place to watch it in north in north america absolutely well thank you very much yep. hopefully we get to do this again thank you John. yes thank you appreciate it